What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lombardi Tom Brews, where I'm your host, John Dowry. Today, yeah, the PowerPoint's back, because today we're going through the 53-man roster prediction for the Green Bay Packers. One last time before cutdown day actually arrives tomorrow. I talked a little bit about this on the watch party, but you can fully expect tomorrow throughout the course of the day, being Tuesday the 27th, you're going to see a bunch of leaks throughout the day, sometimes from players themselves, sometimes from the beat reporters, sometimes from the agents, whatever. And this isn't totally like the draft. For the most part, you can pretty much go with the leaks being factual. But the deadline is indeed 3 p.m. Central tomorrow for the Packers to formally submit what their 53-man roster will be and where everybody else is going. And then the practice squad declarations and all that comes thereafter. So, Tomorrow is a very, very big day for the Green Bay Packers. Maybe not as impactful as the cutdown used to be, now with the expanded practice squad and everything else, plus more favorable IR rules this year, which, unfortunately, I still see some people aren't totally clear on. Keep in mind, it used to be that you had to declare that a player you were going to put on IR had to be on your 53 first and that led to a lot of gamesmanship especially from brian goodekunst in the last couple of years but the nfl said hey this is dumb we should change it to be more practical and this year you could declare two guys to go straight to ir that and they have to be designated to return but still two guys you can put on ir that aren't going to count for your 53 so we may see a little cut down on the gamesmanship regardless let's get into this this is what i believe is going to be the packers 53 man roster at the deadline tomorrow by the way for actual coverage make sure you do join me here on this channel tomorrow also will be on whiskey fanatics we're doing a round table me and whiskey fanatics if you're a regular on this channel you know them well they're pretty much the only group i, I team up with because i trust their content i love their stuff they're really good guys so we're gonna hang out at the deadline tomorrow covering the surprises the studs the duds that the whatever whatever superlatives we can come up with should be a really really good time join us tomorrow afternoon for all of the breaking news. And then Wednesday, just a little old me and my expanded thoughts for out to be live on Friday. So, all right, let's do it. As a refresher, I do always like to post this on 53 man projections. This is the initial 53 from the last three years because COVID did change the game as we saw new rules, stuff like that. So really these are the most three pertinent years when it comes to what Brian Goodkunst and company like to do. So if you're curious about what they've held at the deadline year in and year out, just pause it. Take a look at that. If you're on YouTube, if you're on audio, sorry, it's a whole lot of numbers. Come on over to YouTube. You can check it out. But that is the initial 53 man roster for the last three years. So let's go to quarterback. Now, this one I've actually held on the whole time. And frankly, it could go either way. It sounded like from the last game, from the game against Baltimore, that Matt LaFleur kind of wanted to, Brian Goodkins to go out and shop for a new quarterback. But the reality is, and I'm talking quarterback too, don't have a panic, but the reality is I think Brian Goodekunst is gonna wanna stay true to their develop model. Okay, so it could go either way. Could be Pratt or Clifford, as I'm officially saying that Jordan Love and Sean Clifford will be the two quarterbacks on the team. I think Pratt being a seventh rounder and not totally lighting the league on fire. It's not like he was awful. Yes, Clifford did look worse throughout the course of the preseason and he kind of ultimately training camp too. But it's not like Pratt came out, lit the league on fire and just made it look like for sure someone is going to pick him up. I think at this point, given Pratt was a seventh rounder, given Clifford's preseason, both of them could realistically get to the practice squad. But... I've seen some people theorizing that they'll keep just love and then pick up another quarterback after the deadline and some of that kind of gamesmanship from Gutekunst, but I think Gut's going to want to roll with his developmental QBs. So the way that I kind of break this down, it leads to this question for me. If the coaches had to pick which one would be ready to fill in week one if Jordan Love does go down, which one knows the offense more? Which one is more familiar with what they expect in the routine of being a backup? Well, that's going to cause them to lead Sean Clifford's way. I'm not saying that we should be comfortable with that or that it's great, but I'm saying when choosing between Clifford and Pratt, you probably do lean that way if that's the criteria that you're looking for. And that ultimately gives Sean Clifford the nod for now. 
But I would not be surprised at all if they're able to retain Pratt on the practice squad, which I think they will, throughout the course of the season, if that does kind of evolve and we hear about Pratt beginning to take more than just scout team reps, and then we maybe see a transaction later on in the season. But I think for right now, they would go with the experienced one. So let's take a look at running back. And the injuries here, frankly, might have made things a little bit easier to decipher. So I'm saying this. I think the three on the roster for running backs will be Josh Jacobs, Marshawn Lloyd, and Emmanuel Wilson. But that's because you're putting A.J. Dillon on IR. A.J. Dillon missed the last three games of last year with a shoulder stinger. Already kind of a weird amount of time for a shoulder stinger injury. And now he's got a stinger again in the same shoulder. And the last update we've heard from Matt LaFleur was very vague, very mysterious, and he said that they're still seeking outside medical opinions on what to do with the shoulder. Generally speaking, when it's a recurring injury and you hear a coach talk like that, it's not all that often that all of a sudden the guy just comes back the next week and is good to go. Generally, there's some kind of resolution that has to occur, which is going to take some time, be some therapy, maybe a surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying that all that we know, but I'm saying like, that's kind of what you generally see with these kind of recurring injuries where coaches talk like, yeah, we don't know. He's, he's getting help from elsewhere. Well, that leads me to believe that an IR stint could be on the way for AJ Dillon. And it feels right, right? Because the Packers very much probably want to get Emmanuel Wilson on the 53. This is now two preseasons in a row that Emmanuel Wilson has looked really good. And I've made it known on this channel, like what my opinion is of Wilson and my concerns with Wilson and et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, still, they're probably going to want to get him on the 53. This is two preseasons in a row that he's done incredibly well. The league must have taken some form of notice at this point. So if you've got to declare one on IR, be it Marshawn Lloyd, A.J. Dillon, Dillon sounds like the injury more likely to do it. Lloyd, for his part in all of this with his hamstring injury, he said when it very first happened that he feels as though he's likely to be back week one. Well, we haven't seen evidence of that yet, but that still certainly sounds a lot more promising than the question mark that is A.J. Dillon's shoulder. Now, once we get past week one, or even if they do put Dylan on IR, once we get past week five or six or seven, then, oh, I got no idea what's going to happen with running back. But right now, I'm comfortable saying three with one of them going on IR, and I think it happens to be Dylan that goes on IR. So then wide receivers. I know there's momentum out there about keeping seven wide receivers, and Good's done it before. He's even kept eight one year going farther back. But with some of the talent at other positions, and I know, Wide receivers are more talented than maybe any position on the team. It just feels an awful lot like this is a year for six because you don't really have these other roster spots that you're comfortable shorting to go extra at one spot. So let's just, let's move under the premise that they're going to keep six wide receivers. Okay, Watson, lock. Dobbs, lock. Reed, lock. Wicks, lock. Melton, darn near a lock in spite of some of his struggles. And then the convo that everyone is having. Bose or Heath? who gets the sixth spot. Last time I did one of these, I really leaned DuBose. He's had a massive camp. His first preseason game was excellent. And he also deserves a massive shout out for blossoming him to this tremendous worker, both in the blocking game and on teams. For a high ceiling receiver with great athletic traits, he's shown more than just a willingness to put in the grunt work. And you cannot say that about every single wide receiver, even late round picks with great traits. We've seen plenty that still think they just don't have to do teams. That's not Grant DuBose. He is putting in the work there. So he deserves to be commended for that. But Heath has just not given up. His last preseason game against Baltimore was probably his finest preseason game of the year. Plus, his joint practice against Baltimore was also great, including running right past 428 speed Nate Wiggins, which no one would have expected. It served as a reminder as to why the coaching staff was so high on Malik Heath all summer long. So, in reality, I think either DuBose or Heath would get to the practice squad. I do. There is a lack of wide receiver depth on some teams in the league, but the, the depth issues don't seem to be teams clamoring to get their own five, six, seven receivers. It's like everyone's got a dearth of those. What teams are struggling with is finding a wide receiver three, wide receiver four, two on some teams. So maybe there is a little bit of concern here, but ultimately I think 
Dubose, given the fact that he did kind of fade throughout the preseason, wasn't as strong in game three as he was in game one. That probably took a little bit of shine off for opposing teams in terms of adding him. So I think either one could realistically get to the practice squad. For me, Grant Dubose feels a lot like Bo Melton did last year. Very, very strong camp where he caught everything. Good blocker, good in teams. Coaches loved him. Then he faded a little bit towards the end. For Melton, it was because of an injury. For Dubose, probably just because he's not getting as much attention. Melton got on the practice squad just fine, but then very much became a part of the 53 as the season wore on and there were inevitable injuries as what is a pretty injury-prone position. I think Dubose could absolutely be on that trajectory, not make the roster now, but still go throughout the course of the year on the practice squad. And sometime this year, we will hear from Grant Dubose on the 53. That's ultimately what I picture here. But then that gives you six wide receivers, Watson, Dobbs, Reed, Wicks, Melton, and Heath. Give it to the guy that they love in the run game. Tight ends. Musgrave, Kraft. Uh. <laughs> Obvious locks. And in camp, in terms of Tyler Davis, it really looked like Tyler Davis was the preferred move tight end, the uh, taking on some of the Josiah DeGuara role, uh, lead blocker in some ways. Plus, we know how much he's loved on special teams, not just as a player, but as a leader. So I haven't seen any updates on his current shoulder injury, but if it's more minor or it's not like a guaranteed IR stay or anything like that, then I think Tyler Davis still winds up safe. And as for Ben Sims, I've waffled a little bit, but Ben LaFleur actively uses four tight ends in his offense. It feels like we do this every year where it's like, well, do they really need four? And then his offense genuinely uses four tight ends week in and week out. So like, yeah, <laughs> they, they do need four. It's what his offense calls for. And we get trapped in this every year. So I think Joel Wilson heads to the practice squad. You wind up with four tight ends to, to round out Lafleur's offense. And there you go. It's Musgrave, Kraft, Sims, and Davis. Then for the offensive line, the trench on the offense. Jordan Morgan has missed all of the preseason contests with his shoulder injury, but he is practicing. I think he's going to be active week one. It's just, I don't know as if he's going to be ready to be a starter for week one, but that's not really the point of why we're here today, right? So Morgan, Ryan... They're both locks. Okay, then you got the rest of the starters. Walker, Jenkins, Myers, Tom. All obviously locks, right? That brings us up to six offensive linemen already. Jacob Monk, who has performed way better in games than he has in practice, at least for most of them. He's a lock. And then Dillard, who has gotten less preseason time as it's gone on. Now he's got a shoulder injury that they said is no real concern, so he didn't play against Baltimore. But okay, awfully seems like he's safe. And in fact, I saw some stats earlier in terms of being a left tackle throughout the course of the preseason, when he did play, he happened to be one of the best pass blocking left tackles in all of the league over the course of the preseason. So I think he's pretty safe as a left tackle. Just don't ask him to play the right side. Meanwhile, Kadeem Telford has played both sides. And you can tell how much I've waffled on this because I didn't even catch this one when I proofread it all. On the graphic there, I've got Glover. What I meant to say was Telford, dang nabbit. So anyway, the offensive line that I'm calling for is Morgan, Monk, Dillard, and Telford, not Glover. And here's the reason why. Telford can play both sides. Telford, I think, is the guy more readily available in the early portion of the season. For Travis Glover, he was a day three pick, and we knew when they made the pick that he was a massive potential, but was going to need a world of refinement. And that's exactly what he's looked like in camp and preseason games to this point. When he latches on to a guy, he's incredibly powerful. Drives him down the field. Absolutely. It just doesn't happen nearly as often as it needs to. So given a nine-person line of Walker Jenkins, Myers, Ryan, Tom, Morgan, Monk, Dillard, and Telfort, then I think what we're going to see in practicality is that if an interior lineman goes down, shuffle up Ryan, Morgan, get them both involved. If the left tackle, Rashid Walker, goes down, then you just plug in Dillard. If right tackle goes down, rather than just plugging in Telford, what you're probably doing is kicking out Elton Jenkins to right tackle and then shimming around Ryan and Morgan. As for Glover, Newman, etc., Caleb Jones, Jones, it looks like the experiment is done. He's gotten beat way too often in camp in the limited camp that he had outside of his injuries. Newman, I think hopefully you're able to fetch some kind of day three pick by tomorrow because realistically you need a tackle a lot more than you need another interior lineman. 
And as for Glover, as I said, he needs a lot of refinement. If Goot has been willing to cut a late round draft pick before, it almost always has been an offensive lineman in the form of like Simon Stepaniak. There's, there's been others throughout the years. And I think even Cole Van Lannen was one as well who did not make an initial roster. So he's willing to do it. And I also am very hard pressed to believe that some team out there, given how Glover played in the preseason, is going to scoop him up and stash him on their 53, because that's where you'd have to go. So I think he's safe to make it to the practice squad. So there is your line, nine for the offensive line this year. And I know like it's it's more common to pick 10. It also is more common for the Packers to have 10. I won't be shocked if they add a vet here once rosters are actually settled for week one. But he's done nine as recently as 2021. I think nine offensive linemen is fine. All right, defensive linemen. Let's start off with the defensive ends. And from a numbers perspective, this is where it really starts to get dicey. I wish they could keep five. But I think this is where they cut it down a bit and opt for four. Defensive ends don't really play special teams like other positions do. Plus, as well as Cox has played in the preseason, Mosby has two. And this isn't just because of the Baltimore game. Mosby has been ascending higher and higher throughout the course of training camp. In one-on-ones, he's been victorious more often than not. So I think it becomes a lot more palatable to say, well, if we only keep four, and then we let go Cox and Mosby, we might lose one. We're probably not losing both. Can we live with one of them being the, the end five when we need call-ups and stuff like that? Yeah, probably. So Rashawn, Preston, LVN, and Egbare, those are your locks. And I think that that's where the position ultimately stops. Cox has had a very nice preseason slate. So has Mosby. But I think one gets left in the practice squad. So to me, it just, it makes sense to go with four here, load up on other positions because of how little defensive ends ultimately do in the grand scheme of of the game yeah, ultimately though if if they've got spice to get to five i think they do it but they just they don't need the rotation here they need a d tackle i don't know the reasons are a bunch this just feels right so defensive tackle this is the easiest position on the roster to guess and frankly it got even easier once jonathan ford went down with a calf injury and he was seen in a walking boot after the game so this becomes super easy clark wyatt slayton wooden brooks there you go five done now as for linebacker walker cooper mcduffie wilson hoppa they're all locks. Every one of them. All five. For different reasons, all five are locks. But the question is with Wisconsin native Christian Welch and what Brian Gutekunst decides to do. Because there's a few factors here. Welch historically has been on the team as a strong special teams contributor. Goot has never kept six off-ball linebackers. Plus, is Welch still really needed for teams when we've seen in the preseason Basaccia is using more safeties, less linebackers on teams? Basically, regardless of the string or the alignment, he's using more safeties, less linebackers. So given those three questions, it's really easy to say Welch does not make the team. But there's a few newer factors here. Welch has shown significantly better defensive skills than we've ever seen from him before, both in coverage and the run game. Well, that's bound to help him. Plus, earlier in the offseason, Goof has said, or Goot ha, has said that the switch to a 4-3 may necessitate hanging on to more off-ball linebackers. And per Ken Ingles on Twitter, who, tr who tracks like game activation numbers and averages, they already generally keep over four, thus, of course, five, because you can have point two of a human. They already keep five linebackers for the majority of games. If they're gonna keep more, math tells me that that's six. Plus. Welch is still on most of the first string special teams units, in spite of the influx of safeties. So basically here, with how well Welch has played, with Goot potentially wanting to keep more, and Welch's play still on special teams, I gotta believe he's gonna make the team. So forget precedent here. I think they adapt to a new solution and keep Christian Welch on the team. All right, then the secondary. And I'm going to talk about these two spots all together as one, really, because I think that this is one of the hardest choices on the 53. I've seen a lot of talk about how it seems like it's Welch or Zane. Choose your special teams, Ace. I don't think that's the real conversation. I think it's much more Zane versus Kalen King. I'll explain. Let me just start here for the audio pod folks since they can't see it. But uh, making the team, Jair, Stokes, Nixon, Ballantyne, Valentine. Safeties, Xavier, Bullard, Williams, Anthony Johnson Jr., Aladapo, and Zane Anderson. 
there's your collection of 11 for the secondary. And I did miss all the dot on the graphic. Man, off today, I guess. But still, that gives you a secondary of 11. So let's break this down. If I had a 54th spot to offer, it would go to Kalen King. And maybe this is where we see some gamesmanship. Maybe another, maybe there's an injury that we don't know about that's more severe than we think, and good could puts him on IR and we include Kalen King. Or maybe he does go with zero quarterbacks on the 53 in order to get Kalen King in, and then you do some switches later on. Or maybe zero kickers, and then you do some switches later on. Maybe this is where Brian Goodekunst does the Brian Goodekunst thing and bends outside the rules to get his man. Or maybe there's, you know, other factors at play. But everyone that I listed here, okay? Jair Stokes, Dixon, Valentine, they're all guaranteed locks. Valentine, because of the team's work that he does, because of his work last year, he is darn near a lock and he's a hell of Rochelle and King, so let's include him. Then you go over to safety. X, Bullard, Williams, Anthony Johnson Jr., they're all locks. Aladapo, there's at least a little conversation to be had about whether he should be on the roster or not. Since he's come back from injury, he's been rather up and down, but mostly up. Got a big call out from the floor before the Baltimore game. So, and out of any cut candidate on the team, he's probably the most likely to get picked up somewhere else given his draft pedigree and the fact that he just hasn't played. So, that makes him darn near a lock. Okay, well now you're already at five corners and five safeties. So let's break down the candidates for the last spot. Because I think it's kind of a three-way race, maybe two ahead of the other, but you got Zane Anderson, Kevin King, or Kalen King, ooh, and Robert Rochelle. With Zane, he's had some flashes against the backup offense. He's come up with a couple interceptions throughout the course of training camp. But we know that he's mostly a team's work guy, and he's still, just like Welch, he's been on the first team of kickoff coverage, punts. Zane Anderson's still on the first string for most of the special teams lineups. It's not too often that at the end of camp, Rich Bisaccia has included a guy in the first team strings unit that ultimately has gotten cut. So, moving on to Kalen King. He has had some really tremendous days in camp. He was even my player of the day, I think, on like day three. He's got ball hawk skills. He does man coverage pretty well, as long as you don't have to ask him to pass off to another defender. When he locks on for a hit, he can deliver it. But... There have been times where he's been exposed for his flaws. He has not shown tremendous versatility as a zone corner yet. As I mentioned, the passing off thing. There's other issues here for Kalen King that have kind of been exposed in games. Speaking of getting exposed in games, if he doesn't lock on for a hit, a tackle probably isn't being made. It's just not a strength of his game yet. Plus, he doesn't do a lot on special teams. So with the way, and I'm going to say one more thing here too. When, when you take into account how they've rolled out the defensive alignments, realistically, Kalen King isn't even slot two. He's probably slot three. And I say that because any time that Keyshawn Nixon hasn't been going in camp or a game, they put Javon Bullard in the slot and bring in Evan Williams to be the counterpart to Xavier McKinney. To me, on a practical level, that says Bullard is slot two, not King. If King were truly slot two, he would just come in when Nixon's not there, but he hasn't. They've shifted guys all around instead. So uh, to me, that kind of spells that there's a gap there. So he doesn't play a lot of special teams, and he's your slot three? Guys like that don't generally make the team. I don't have to like it. It's the truth. And if I had a 54th spot, I'd give it to King. But I don't. That makes this a tremendous difficult cut. And then the last can candidate here, you've got Robert Rochelle, Valentine's counterpart last year. He's a strong special teams corner. He's had a couple of flashes coverage-wise and snaps, especially like in games. He's just a guy who, if he doesn't wind up in Green Bay, he's going to wind up on somebody's 53 for at least a couple games this year, some point this year. But I, given the candidates here, I just don't think Rochelle's done enough. I think King's deficiencies are, are just too loud for the where they are as a team right now. I think they're going to want Zane Anderson. So go with Zane in the secondary and King, first man up off the bench, off the practice squad, retained on the practice squad, along with Grant Dupose. And then, of course, you've got the specialists. Yeah, I got to give it to little big buddies. Anders Carlson, it's his job for now. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he's not the week one kicker, but I do think he has beat out Greg Joseph. I think the last week and a half or so has really turned the tides there. I think Anders is your kicker. Same kind of thing with Orzik. Like, he's beaten out. 
Peter Bowden from Wisconsin, as evidenced by the fact that they felt comfortable letting go Bowden a couple weeks ago for bringing him back. So I think it's Orzik's job. But I wouldn't call him tremendously safe. The only one of the three specialists is Dan Whelan, who looks to be in an all-world punter real soon as an Irishman. So, I mean, let's go, at least for now, on the initial 53, let's say that those are your three specialists. I just don't think that the Packers are going to roll with zero kickers on the 53 and then go sign someone later. I think they're at least going to be a little bit more cautious than that, include Anders, and perhaps upgrade as we go. So there you go. There's the 53. Two quarterbacks, three running backs, six wide receivers, four tight ends, nine offensive linemen to go along with five defensive tackles, four defensive ends, six linebackers, five corners, six safeties, special teams with three, giving you a grand total of 24 on offense, 26 on defense, 53 on the roster. That's it. That is my final prediction. We will find out tomorrow remember joint show with wisco fanatics at the deadline i think we're going to go live about 2 45 p.m central but we are going to take you over the deadline we're going to be hanging out talking for a while about all things green bay packers at the 53 the studs the duds the surprises the disappointments and where do we go from here it's the big question effective tomorrow thanks so much for joining me here on lombardi time brews Tune in Wednesday, too, for my expanded thoughts, just me and myself. And then on Friday, Lombardi Time Brews live before we actually return to a normal schedule as football returns to a normal schedule next week. Thanks so much for being here. Hope you are having a fantastic day. And as always, Go Pack Go!